We are back and ready to kick off our round number one of the Swiss of Masters Tour, Yon Chiping. Uh, I cannot wait to get this going, G. I think it's uh, so hype when uh, a Swiss starts. It's the first round. Everyone's in. Everyone's about to put their lineups to the test for the first match. And we're going to have Blyes versus Fury Hunter coming up for our main match. But just a reminder, if you don't know how this normally goes, we will cast a main match from the start to end. And then we will show you some of the matches across the round uh, just until the round is finished. Finished, and we'll be moving on to round number two and so forth. Uh, just to make sure that it's not just a one match and then, you know, we'll see you later. We're going to cover as much Hearthstone as possible. But these two players, G, are very important for the uh, for the European uh, Grandmasters run here. Yes, uh, Blyze is all but sealed to be a future Grandmaster. Of course, from last year, the narrative began already that France was the most dominant region when it came to the Masters towards the new EU GMs being Falcon and Zim. And now we have Blyze looking to take another spot because he's won not one, but two Masters tours already. It seems unreal to me to actually have that level of consistency. Yeah, and it is. And, and it, it's amazing to win one. It's amazing to even just say top eight, two, right? That is an mm. incredible feat. To win two, and the fact that I am going to say the words, he could just win three, <laughs> is ridiculous. It should it should never happen, but I really hope it does. Uh, as we see the players line up saying, it is going to be the Druid Demon Hunter Warlock Warrior uh, against a Warrior Warlock Mage Druid No demon hunter for fury hunter which is going to get weird i'm glad he's not bringing hunter because then i could be saying hunter far too many times in one cast uh, but what do you make of this just suddenly the expectations have just been thrown right out the window yeah yeah, right off the bat, we're seeing from Fury Hunter himself, a very seasoned player from the HCT circuit, making appearances at EU versus CN, and now bringing a lineup which, just for the lack of that one class, is very controversial, I'll call it. Um, we saw this in APAC from Rivius, for example, in GM, where he just left out the Demon Hunter, and it worked out for him in one series in the playoffs, but didn't end up helping that much later on. The thinking could be that Demon Hunter is overhyped because as we've seen in the graphics, the win percentage isn't nearly as high as Warrior, but I would be skeptical to say the least. Yeah, it's super interesting to me because when I see someone submit Druid, uh, they're accepting that they think Druid is very strong. And then if they expect, if they're doing that, you have to expect a good chunk of your opponents will do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the case, like to me, Demon Hunter seems like a good pick go going into Druid because I think like it's, it stomps so hard in that matchup and in the early game specifically. It seems pretty good, but Fury Hunter, I don't know, maybe watching the way uh, the, the European Grandmasters ended has decided that Mage is the way to go and he might try and uh, replicate a certain Silver Name's success uh, with some victory here. But Bly is going for a much more expected lineup on my side here with the Warrior Demon Hunter and then going for that Warlock and Druid. It's, it's going to be a close matchup, but as I seem to be quite often, at least in Grandmasters, you always have to look at those third and fourth decks. And for me, I always worry about Mage in this current meta and if it's going to be good enough. Very true. And you brought up the fact that um, we are a little bit longer on their bands. And you know what? I would be... I would have a very difficult time to expect from what Fury Hunter is actually going to be banning himself based on not bringing Demon Hunter. I feel like that strategy kind of lends itself to leaving up Warrior on the other side, for example, and banning away their Demon Hunter instead. But that also largely depends on how well you think your lineup does against Warrior. I'm of the opinion that uh, Warlock is not actually favored versus Warrior, but I've heard people say that this new Dragon Heavier package of Druid with the Emerald Explorers has a much better matchup against Warrior, right. and maybe the Mage does as well. And he actually goes with the Druid ban. Yeah, and, and this is very interesting here. So just uh, pulling up the deck list for the players, uh, Fury Hunter is bringing that, uh, I don't even know what to call it, honestly, the weird control warrior with there's Cargoth Bladefist, but there's Magtheridon in there. There's the Double Brawl. There's the Cobbled Sticky Finger in there. And the Galakrond as well as the Deathwing at the very top. Uh, the eight mana Deathwing. Um, so Fury Hunter, although a little bit unfortunate, I feel like I wanted to see this warrior get played. Um, but he is going to uh, get that banned out and end his lineup with a much more uh, generally seen, uh, obviously, Highlander Mage. And then he's going to have that Druid, which is pretty standard with just the two Mount Cells and Emerald Explorers, as you mentioned. Uh, and then the last one is just the quest warlock so a little bit upset that warrior got banned but i fully get why is that seems like it would have done a very good job against Blizz's lineup 
true enough. We are also hearing some whisperings from the Twitterverse that some people think that Druid is going to be the sleeper of this meta, much to Saddle chagrin. Um, <laughs> I think that the new build that we saw from a couple of the GMs at the last week during playoffs has a lot of potential to it. Just having that mid game and extra threats and more consistent ramp can be very scary to some people. But we see that the Blizzard's Druid is actually the older version with just the Glowfly, Mount Sellers, Ysera, right. and none of the Emerald Explorers or Breath of Dreams. So I'm even more curious that Fury Hunter chose to ban that when, say, Warlock might have a slightly better chance of dealing with that version. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, right? Because it's one of those weird options of we've seen players leave up Warrior before. And I think the players, I've personally been on the, the, the side of saying, well, leaving up Warrior just has to be wrong. Although there are reasons and it doesn't necessarily dictate the, the way the match is either won or lost. But to me, it just says, okay, you start the match 1-0. Uh, because you get to play Warrior and it's almost certainly going to win. Um, so for me, I see it as a mistake. Uh, I think I would always just ban the Warrior and leave the Druid up, even with Fury under slightly different lineup, purely because the Druid still has chances to whiff, right? There's a lot of discussion going on. Well, if you draw the ramp, great. Or if you draw the Glowfly in the certain matchups, great. But if you don't, you're in a lot of trouble compared to, uh, you know, against a lot of matchups. So for me, I think banning the Druid shows a little bit too much respect here from Fury Hunter. But he has definitely been doing his own thing. and uh, He's apparently he's been practicing a lot with Wyra, who's, uh, for me at least, uh, someone I've talked about for years now, is just one of the best deck builders I've, I've ever seen. I will play anything he, he tells me about because it's that powerful. Uh, but he definitely does his own thing. And that seems to have rubbed off on uh, Fury Hunter here. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought up Wire because that, you know, explains a lot to me from what I'm seeing. I think <laughs> that when I looked at these classes, I was seeing, okay, just looks like the bread and butter warrior and druid. But you mentioned how the warrior is actually more of a control variant. The druid also is very different. Aside from having that dragon package, it's actually also running two of Claw, two of Worthy Expedition, cutting some of the card draw like Rising Winds to, from what I expect, have a better removal game plan against Demon Fury Hunter could very well be targeting Demon Hunter if he's leaving it up. Yeah, and I think that's something that is still very uh, like questionable, right? Is just the power of Demon Hunter because on the surface level, it's like, of course it's powerful. Look how good how good its cards are. Look, it seems to uh, guarantee almost at some point a win in most matchups. But when we see the actual win rate from Grandmasters, for example. It's not mind blowing, is it? It's still good. It's better than most classes, but by what, 52, 53%, I think it was, which again isn't that powerful, uh, at least in just a raw win rate. But when you consider everyone's leaving it up, uh, it means that you'd imagine there'll be some level of targeting for it. But it still managed to get plus uh, 50%, which seems pretty good overall. Yeah, I would agree. Last night, I actually a chance to spectate Sintelol playing and he was like, Gia, do I have to bring DH? I hate the deck so much. I watched him play a bunch of games on ladder and he just lost so many in a row. I would argue because opponents got better draws and he didn't, but um, I can understand the reasoning for not bringing it. There's some people that just don't believe in the power level of the deck and, you know, the more I look at Fury Hunter's lineup in the Warlock, we're seeing two of Cards of Defender instead of the Abyssal Summoner. We're seeing Sky General Krag. There is just right. a lot of uh, anti-aggro tech that makes me think that this is the deck that he is really trying to beat. Yeah, and I'm I'm really glad. Uh, we are getting to the match, by the way. We're just making sure the players are all ready. Of, of course, it's the first round of Swiss. We just want to make sure everything kicks off smoothly for you guys, and most importantly for the players, of course. But I have seen a few pl players uh, tweet about, say, Sky Captain, slightly different builds of Warlock. Uh, but I am glad we're seeing Fury Hunter play in round one. And uh, not only because, again, he was a player that was on the, the scoreboard and the, uh, the contention of GM, but also... It's just the test, right? You get to see if this lineup's going to do the work because Fury Hunter isn't bringing a standard lineup. And if this goes miserably in round one, you've got to think there's got to be a certain level of mm -hmm. fear factor, right? If you bring a risky lineup into a big Swiss tournament, round one, it just falls over. You have to be pretty afraid uh, going into the rest. So I think we're going to get a good idea of what the rest of the tournament's going to look like for Fury Hunter after this match.
Right. You call it risky, but I guess it's very fair to note that you and I as GM casters have a built-in bias for what is and isn't risky because we've been casting a relatively stable meta for the past few weeks now among a smaller sample size of 48 players. But of course, the greater Hearthstone competitive environment is far many more players. And these guys have been doing a lot of testing themselves. They've been grinding on ladder. They've been playing opens to qualify and of course, testing within their own practice groups. So I think from Fury Hunter's perspective, to have have the guts to bring something that's this different from what you're seeing on stream every week. You have to have a strong reasoning for it. And I am also very excited to see whether a control style lineup can actually beat out the demon hunters. Yeah, it, it's it, ah, it's so interesting. We are getting just we're getting closer to getting ready for the first match. Don't mm -hmm. worry, guys. I just want to keep you up today. We're not just say chatting because we don't want the players to start, trust me. Uh, but but yeah, it, it's it's just one of those big questions of uh, it's it's like an age old conquest thing, right? Do you just bring the four best decks as just a base power level, or do you try and target something? The risk, I guess, with the targeting is if it's just not good enough, not strong enough, or you've um, misinterpreted the meta, so then not as many players as you would hope are bringing whatever you're trying to target. You can fall over a, li a little bit. It is a little bit more risky, but if it pays off, you do probably make the top cut, right? If you if We've seen it in the past where if the players just read it that little bit right then and get the right opponents, they will make that top eight. So again, I'm excited to see if it pay off. But Bly's, th there's a chance, Gia, that Bly's just wins three Masters Tours, which would be <laughs> yeah. truly ridiculous. Not only because it would earn him a lot of prize money, but it would get him into, well, it would already get him into GM, but it would just be unheard of. It would probably be the, uh, the most powerful streak in, in history. And I'm not saying mm -hmm. that players haven't done well for longer of course they have when we see the likes of Saiyan of Hunter Ace and, and um, uh, Pavel as well and uh, plenty of other players but to just literally win three majors back to back of this size would be uh, truly miraculous. I completely agree, especially when you factor in that the HCT system, some of those tournaments were just you could sign up and show up and that's it. These Masters Tours, you have to jump through a lot of hurdles to actually even qualify to the tournaments. You either have to make a certain amount of top eights, you have to get a ladder finish, or you need to have performed very well in the previous Masters Tour. But there you have it, the two that will be going up against each other. And it looks like we're starting off with the Druid already for Fury Hunter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this. Uh, I really want to just see how this plays out. As you mentioned earlier, the Druid is running the two claws that I've seen people mess around with a little bit, and then the two worthy expeditions, as well as the Breath of Dreams uh, package. But for me, th this is just the test, right? Warrior's being left up. If it gets a win, it doesn't mean that, oh, you know, Fury Hunter completely messed up. What's he doing? He's probably expecting Warrior to grab a win anyway, but I am just interested to see uh, how these tools perform, as it does look like we are getting to game number one. Finally, apologies about the delay. We are ready to go. Fury Hunter versus Blyze. Blyze on the top on the Warrior, Fury Hunter on the bottom on that Druid. And so far, Gia, as a Mulligan specialist, what do you make of this for Fury Hunter? Insane. Absolutely insane. He has card draw, double ramp, and the Glowfly. I will say that Glowfly is very risky to get down in this matchup because of the risky skipper blood boil punish, but if it can be turboed out early, then it can sometimes blow Warrior out of the water. We do see Fury Hunter toss it, though I think very likely to just be looking for a dragon, which he needs to activate that Breath of Dreams. Someone's gotta lead the charge! Yeah, that is the problem with the card. I say, I say problem, the, the, the caveat, I guess, is that you do need to have one of those dragons, which is why those emeralds are, are in there. But so far for Blyze, he doesn't really have an explosive opening hand himself. He doesn't have that Corsair cash, uh, which is really what you want to unlock some of the hand. Although he has naturally drawn a risky skipper, which is going to be great because hmm. you kind of don't want to have to use it early on in this matchup, but you do need to have an answer for an early Glowfly Swarm, because if not, you're in trouble. It's actually generated by the Sky Raider, which is yeah. huge to have an extra one in uh, just the back pocket. But I think we do see from Fury Hunter that he's not relying on that Glowfly game plan. I think it would be more likely for him to search for the ramp to get the Mount Sellers, the dragons, and try and present one big threat or several um, high health minions, which is much more problematic for Warrior to deal with. But we already see Blizes committing Inner Rage and Rampage and trying to get the pressure through. Bloodsworn on the follow-up is immense. 
Yeah, it's pretty huge, and there's no answer we can see here for Fury Hunter. Which means he's just got to deal with it, and this might just be too too fast, right? Like, the Druid yeah. doesn't really have great early removal tools. Yes, there's claws and stuff in this list, but all of those things cost mana. It's not like right here now, Fury Hunter's had a chance to ramp and just go, okay, claw, claw, crystal power, crystal power, done. Um, he, he doesn't really, or hasn't had the capability to do that, so... Yeah. Now he's got the rough choice. He could coin out Overgrowth to try and just go for the ramp. But the problem is, is he just already dead at that point? It really seems like it was really problematic that he'd not hit a dragon to actually ramp out with the Breath of Dreams. Because we can see, even if he coins out the Overgrowth, he'd only be going to six mana next turn, which means the Bog Beam in hand and the Iron Bark are still not free. So we could just see him use these Iron Bark to get rid of only one of the six fours, and Blyzus has another inner rage to push more damage. However, he's not got threats that he wants to develop, because this is certainly not a board you want to play Terran on. Oh, that's a good draw, though. Corsair mm -hmm. Cash, although obviously he cannot equip it yet, it just gives him something, right? It gives him something to not only push more damage with, but to keep those resources flowing. And Fury Hunter, because he had to commit to some removal, it means he didn't ramp, which, although... I agree, as I said, is Fury Hunter just dead if he ramps? Is he just dead if he doesn't ramp? Because what else is he going to do this follow-up? If it's going to be Bog Beam, then that's just, just as slow and just yeah. as likely to lead to his demise in this game. I mean, he could still ramp this turn and get the free spells, but the thing is, he didn't draw into any additional removal. This list from Fury Hunter is not running the Moonfires, no Rising Winds, no Power of the Wild, in favor of having those more flexible cards like Claw and Worthy Expedition, but none of those entered the hand. He just doesn't have an answer right. for the 6 4. And I think, again, this is just uh, Blythe displaying a really good knowledge of the game as well, because. He knows what this druid's weakness is, and you wouldn't normally try and just go with a you know the big buff early on in your average matchup. But against druid, they need to have very specific answers here. And as you mentioned as well uh, a little bit earlier on, I think with the no moon fires, it means that there wasn't even the zero mana ways to help deal some of this extra damage. And just like that, warrior's going to get a win, applies is going to get a win, and go one zero up versus fury hunter. His Druid just never got going, and although I do not want to just pin a lot on that single game of Hearthstone, it didn't look great. But he left Warrior up. He knew this could happen. He knows the power of Warrior, and I guess now is where the series really starts for Fury Hunter. Would you agree? I would, and even though I agree with expecting Warrior to be, you know, taking a win at some point, never in my life have I seen a Sky Raider deal that much damage. <laughs> that was crazy. Just solo the game, why not? Yep. Um, I do think that is not too much sweat off of Fury Hunter's back, though. You and I seem to be um, posturing that maybe that... Uh, he's going after Demon Hunter more so than the Warrior. Mm -hmm. Just given the anti-aggro text, we also see from Fury Hunter's Warlock, he's got the Cartooth Defenders, which I don't feel are particularly useful in other matchups than Demon Hunter. So that could be what he's going against. I just don't know how consistently Mage can right. fit that equation, though. Yeah, and... Um, uh... Yeah, I, I will say as well, just just as a side, uh, the Kartuts in Warlock do very well versus Hunter as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Just for that, again, just raw damage aggressive matchup, the extra heal can really help. Uh, but yeah, generally we'll have to see, and, and I just want to reiterate, the, the problem with the leaving Warrior up and hard target like one other deck idea is you need to be very confident you can win those other matchups, right? And Because the second you lose it, you are done. So we'll see what happens here. We are going to go into game number two, and it's going to be a Quest Warlock Mirror. It's been a while since we've cast one of these, of course, very towards the late game. But just looking at the list, we talked about the Kartut, and Blyzus has the Abyssal Summoner. So that's going to be much more in Blyzus' favor if he wants to go for a tempo-oriented mid-game plan. Of course, that's not the end-all be-all of the matchup. It is much more dependent on who gets their quest done early. Yeah, uh, th there are bigger problems as well. Uh, not only uh, as we've seen that the uh, the player with the Abyssal Summoners has a huge advantage. If you just drop an 8-8 or a 9-9 on the board, it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, and the response, as you mentioned, the card touch, which are 3-4s, not quite the same level of threat. Uh, Fury Hunter's also running double Acidic Swampoos in his list. 
which effectively does nothing versus Quest Warlock. Uh, he's also running that Sky General Crag, which although is a decent value card, just isn't that much of a threat against right. Quest Warlock once again. So it's not even just the card tuts, it's the card tuts and then some that are very tech towards this anti-aggro. So I think that Blyze has all the um, all the time and freedom in the world here to really secure the win in this mirror match. I would agree. Um, he's not got the plot twist for himself, but he does have additional time also because to make room for these oozes, um, Fairy Hunter has cut a soul fire, which is much less burst that you have to be worried about from Liza's perspective. He's also running uh, one sense demons on both sides. There are some lists that have two of the sense demons, but I think having less damage that you can threaten is very important in the matchup because your opponent can feel much more comfortable to take risks. Right. And now is about the time the game starts to go because players can't keep tapping. <laughs> just there's a limit on hand size. So uh, yeah, after a few early taps, we do see the first few responses there. And Fiori Hunter, as we saw, just getting rid of a news. Why not? As I said, not important in this match, more important to free up some hand space. That's right. You talked about how now, the oozes were potentially useless in the matchup and for the most part i agree but at the very least they are a dumpable card that you don't feel sad about throwing out there sure. whereas say with zephyrus you would have to ask yourself is this better to make room in my hand now or is it more worth it to keep for the possible upside later on but for fury hunter definitely looking at a plot twist this turn yeah and although i mentioned the uh the I feel one-sidedness in this specific game of Bly's just having all the good tech and Fury Hunter having the tech that is not least relevant. If one player, i.e. Fury Hunter, activates quests significantly earlier than Bly's here, then regardless of tech cards, he gets cards for free, which, yeah. which means he can leap ahead in the game, even though he has a lot of extra cards that aren't going to be quite good enough in a, a, a fair mirror, I'll call it, but again. Who cares about fair when you can activate your quest way faster than your opponent? So far, not the greatest draw for Blizzus, but he can coin out one of these Abyssal Summoners if he wants. Start putting the pressure onto Fury Hunter, but if he's going for Reign of Fire, expect to see just the questing and a tap. Prioritizing the quest way. completion rather than giving Fury Hunter an easy Dark Skies because his Moar would have been left on board. Yeah, and I think, especially after seeing Plot Twist, Blizz will want to accelerate his own quest as quickly as possible and although the abyssal summoners are very very powerful they're often not game winning on their own especially if your opponent does their quest so quickly so i, I do like this from Blyze actually not going too all in on the uh, summoner and just saying actually i'm just going to keep cycling keep progressing that quest and still have a couple of minions to help out with some removal if fury hunter's response is strong and it does look to be pretty strong. At the 18 out of 20 quest completion, we could see him go Mortal Coil and then dump the Netherwing and then naturally the quest with his draw next turn. Also make some hand space for that. I guess he does have to start being a little bit concerned with his health total. Uh, Blyza's early minions have managed to, between the taps um, of Fury Hunter, put him down to 19 Fury Hunt. Uh, Hunter's own nether wing could put him down to 16 and as we've discussed the around 18 mark is where it get, gets scary however it's still very far off from Blyza's being able to cheat out a Malagos for example right there are times though when it's just say you know double nether breath soul fire <laughs> gets the job done you can just die sometimes even without the help of the Malagos but see Fury Hunter just gonna clean up here and get this sense demon so uh, kind of solving two problems, right? Or three problems, I guess. Complete the quest, clear the board, and heal for a bit. Uh, above 20, uh, which is relatively safe at this point, especially pre-quest for Blyze. So I like this again from Furion to just saying, don't need to do anything too dramatic. Just going to uh, draw draw the cards, heal, get this quest done. But now is the time Whoa. where he's facing down the Abyssal Summoner. Well, who cares? Yeah. Just draw Kaladin. <laughs> There's an answer, but I'm sure Fury Hunter already wants to start going for some taps here. We could see him go for more Dark Skies and tap. Uh, if you go more Dark Skies, the Dark Skies gets 9 procs, and there will be less than 18 health on board. Um, it does feel, of course, a little bit awkward to draw out the Moar without getting the full heal from Nether Breath later on, so we do just see him go for the Keladon here. Yeah, I, I do like this because one, obviously, Kaladin's effect is when it's drawn. 
he can uh, wipe the whole board. Uh, and yes, it, do it, it means Fury Hunter can't tap, but most importantly, it's a clean board, and now Fury Hunter has just a minion that's sticking around. And even if this hits once or twice, it does make some level of impact and, uh, and, and messes with some of the options that Blyas might want to do anyway. Blyas has hit his own plot twist now and quest completion, which is huge, because Fury Hunter, another reason we might oh. not see him Oh, didn't see him go for tap last turn was because Malugos and Alex Straza are already in hand. Those are the cards he really wants to discount. Maybe he would prioritize tapping more if he's able to plot twist them back. But all I know is Blyza is in a great spot now, has that quest online and the hand space to be able to tap again next turn. Yeah, now both players have to do the uh, post-quest dance in this mirror. In the, as you can see, Fury Hunter has to respect his opponent's board because any extra damage is extra damage, and you could just die. But also, in the same time, Fury Hunter wants to do the same back to flies, right? Make a bit of a board, or at least keep tapping to get to these burst plans. So we're just going to see a real back and forth of how much each player respects the other player's board, as well as how many cards they've drawn for zero mana as well. So it's going to be pretty intense here. The tap from Bly is only a dark sky. Not a huge outcome in this matchup. Of course, it's ideal to discount either regular Alexstrasza or Malagos, but even discounting the burst spells, Soulfire, Rain, Rain of Fire and Nether Breath can be huge. We're seeing Fury Hunter just drop down his Alex Straza here, which I hardly see this played for tempo, but we could just be thinking from Fury Hunter's perspective that there's nothing else that he particularly wants to drop. Um, because Blyzas has the answer now, though, it'll be difficult for Fury Hunter. Oh, that's active! Life and hope are worth fighting for. <laughs> <laughs> I dream in the world. Oh my. Yeah, okay. I mean, Fury Hunter did draw his best answer, though, with the Twisting Nether. The 5-6 uh, is very awkward in that it requires Fury Hunter to expend another piece of removal if he wants a truly clean board. So we could just see Twisting Nether plus Nether Breath, because at the same time, um, if he taps, he might be overdrawing. Okay, that's dumpable, though. Yeah, you make a great point that Blaze now has the right to just threat chain. He knows that he's expended so many resources from Fury Hunter's hand. And um, at that point, before the plot twist, he already had Malagos and Coin in hand. Nothing discounted, but able to burst for 8 damage in hand minimum. Sorry, 9. Uh, we see him twists, though. I just really like that his tap once again just gave him a Dark Skies. Um, <laughs> it was just really funny that like, his hand looks very similar to a uh, pre-plot twist. But it is a problem though, right? Fury Hunter has to deal with this. Does have Dark Skies still? As long as Fury Hunter fits in the taps every turn, I think he'd be in a decent spot. I feel like we could have seen the left most uh, Netherwing come down at several points earlier in this game. But at this point, I still think it is fine. Of course, it's scary to be going down to 19 health, but that's one above that all-important breakpoint of Malagos and two soul fires. Right. And most importantly, it just gets that threat on the board, doesn't it? Wise has the very easy answer, but still. <laughs> Uh, 
as a huh. Sky General Crack. It's interesting to me that Blaze didn't drop his own Netherwing just on board for more tempo, you said. Uh, the threat training is pretty good here, but he could be saving it to deal with some other type of development from Fury Hunter. Yeah, I also uh, think one of the problems that you can run into sometimes is if he played that Netherwing, then if he draws his... I think he's still got Nether Breath left, then... If he wants to Alex, he can't Alex and then use a Nether Breath afterwards. True. So that Netherwing, although I agree, a great tempo play there, uh, could more often be his sort of battery for for uh, activating the Nether Breath on his side. Because uh, I've done that tons of like an embarrassing amount of times. Actually, he's gone okay, great play, Netherwing, Alex. Oh wait, my Nether Breaths don't do the thing now. That's annoying. <laughs> um, so it's just something that you you can keep an eye on in case he needs to hold it for that. Right. It is, at worst, just another 3 damage burst as well. Blyze is down to 4 cards in the deck, is looking to discount that Malagos that he shuffled back down to 0. And Fury Hunter has his own Malagos still stranded in hand. Uh, another breath on both sides has been expended, but Fury Hunter is naturally running less burst. So I think it's really on Fury Hunter to find a way to survive, whereas Blyze is pushing the offensive. Yeah, Fury, Fury Hunter still has his card tuts, right? Have I, have I gone crazy or has he still got two card tuts in that bottom five? Because that could help yeah. a lot. That's a lot of extra healing. If he manages to kill them off at the same time, but we see Blyze dropping his own Alex Raza, the Malagos is in hand. He still has held onto coin this whole game. So both soul fires potentially dealing 18 just from hand if they don't discard each other. And... I'm not seeing a great way out of this for Fury Hunter. He still has that second Moarg Nether Breath, but if he goes for that defensively, I'm not sure what his win well, condition left can uh, be. Yeah, he's still three off, isn't he? He's so close, though. Mm -hmm. With the the Netherwing Malago Soulfire Breath. Yeah. If Although anyone... again, he wouldn't. He would. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, he wouldn't be able to do that, right? That's the problem. So it's actually a little bit further away. If he had managed to discount any of his spells alongside Malagos um, on top of the Nether Breath, that would have potentially been huge. Zephyr is active. Fury Hunter just having to go all in on defensive here. Heal up, clear the board once again, but as we mentioned, that's almost a, uh, all of his aggression just gone at this point. Still a decent amount of burst left, but yeah, it's crucial that he had to use his only discounted spell. Blyzus has that nether breath as well. Well, if Blyzus can't do it in one turn, then the Kartok can trade off and then Fury Hunter can use Reign of Fire to kill off the reborn Kartok as well, which although will damage him a little bit, will heal him for that little bit more. And uh, as we've mentioned throughout the game, it's important to stay above maybe mid to uh, late teens, really, of, of health. You want to stay 20 plus. So... Such an intricate situation oh, now for Blyzus. We could see him hold on to all of the burst for next turn. Malagos, Soulfire, Coin, Soulfire, Ze sorry, Zephyrus first for mm. Moonfire, but it probably doesn't give you Moonfire unless it sees lethal. So it there is lethal in hand, but it has a chance of discarding each other. And so we see Blyzus just for some of that damage first and try to make sure that he doesn't die this turn as well. Is it too crazy to suggest, like, Kato, uh, attack with everything, of course, but like mm -hmm. Kato, Netherwing, Rain, is that ridiculous? Um, well, if you take the three from the Netherwing and Rain, it kind of cancels out, right? The healing. But with two, yeah, if you play the oh, other, other Kato, yeah, yeah, okay. play them both, because then they'll both be on one health. Um, mm -hmm. but most importantly, it just procs them. I know you still take four, but you'd heal for six, and is is two just enough? right now with them still on the board? I don't think that the breakpoint between 19 and 21 is especially relevant. I think um, for Fury Hunter, oh. yeah, he was looking for board development instead. Just praying that he okay. lives to see the end of this turn. 
Okay, none of the crazy ones. <laughs> Good to know. Because there's one Nazari away from a bit of a crazy game right there. But there's also just the, the zero mana Zephyrus as well. I'm interested to see what Blyze's plan for the Zephyrus is, and if he just has it. Well, if it's not discarded, it should yeah. give Moonfire after these Soul Fires go through, and that would be lethal. Oh. But okay, still active. Okay. Yeah, he got it. Wow, that was that go. was close. A Fury Hunter, unhappy as you could see there with the outcome of double Soul Fire, and not only could Soul Fire have discarded the other Soul Fire, of course, is. Each time one was played, it was progressively more likely that the Zephyrus would be discarded, but it wasn't. And Blyze is going to take a, another victory there. And honestly, a uh, um, uh, mirror match or a matchup that was a lot closer than I expected it to be. I guess you, we could argue that how does Fury Hunter actually win that game at that very late game state? But I'm just surprised it went that long. I thought some of the uh, anti-aggro tech was going to hinder Fury Hunter a little bit more than it did. I think we did see it hinder him, though, towards the mid-game, where right. as far as Blyzos was concerned, he didn't have to worry about threats on the other side. He managed to get his quest done even with a later plot twist than Fury Hunter had. After the threat chains came down, he was just able to put together that burst. Um, I will say, though, for Fury Hunter, it was a bit unfortunate to have that Malago stuck in hand that whole time, not able to discount down one of the dragons and right. of course that zero mana dragon queen on the other side was backbreaking essentially forced fury hunter to pass a turn yeah that's it right it's huge because uh, as i mentioned at the time it was getting to that point where a player makes a board the other player has to clear it and then so on but if you can do both in the same turn that just completely flips the initiative uh to to at the time blies of course and it really did just force fury hunter on the back foot but i believe we are getting uh, straight into our game number three and honestly if this starts if, if round one match one on stream starts off with a quick three zero and the person who is 3-0'd is the winner of the previous two Masters Tours. I'm just going to say right now, Blyze is going to win a third. Because oh, this, this, is looking, this is looking incredible. What's going on? I mean, he's got Warlock, though. The deck that you thought wouldn't be performing too well. <laughs> Have to take a side now, Raven. Well, if everyone brings Warlock, someone has to win the tournament, right? So okay. if Warlock could still perform <laughs> not well, and he could still win. He could still take the most losses and still win the tournament. So very, very doable. But we see here Blyze just having his Demon Hunter left with to get a victory here. And just a quick rundown of the Demon Hunter list. Uh, pretty much the fairly standard now, I would say, Bone Chewer Brawler in there. Mm -hmm. Just the one I beam and still the two Vulpira Scoundrels. So still the option of getting some of those extra spells that can really help out. Yeah, we've seen a lot of different texts to, toward how to build Demon Hunter. I think that the Bone Chewer helps in plenty of matchups, just smoothing out the curve. But particularly the Volpera has been more popular outside APAC, whereas seeing Blowtorch Saboteurs and things that are specifically for the right. mirror. Um, in terms of tech cards, though, we also see that Fury Hunter, we saw it a while ago, he had the double oozes, I think, with this matchup very much in mind. So even though he's 0-2, shouldn't count him out just yet. And he has an answer for this early board with the Dark Skies. Right, and, and this is the... This is the strange thing about competitive Hearthstone sometimes, is if you're just tuning in, it looks really bad for Fury Hunter, and being 0-2 down is never really a good thing. But now he, all he has to do is beat the deck, he's built his lineup to beat three times, right? And, and he wins. So it's very, very possible still that Fury Hunter takes this victory. My my worry is, can Demon Hunter be counted that consistently? It is the, my question, and I guess the question we're going to see answered once we see Fury Hunter's end results at the end of the Swiss. Yeah, a small footnote is that that's mainly my posturing, that Fury Hunter has built the lineup to beat Demon Hunter. It could very well be that he's just um, added tech cards for more of a soft target strategy, but this is a matchup he should ex be expecting to see at the very least. Right. And already committing the Moarg Nether Breath, it was too threatening to leave the cane there, although I was thinking about if there was room to go for the Sense Demons, because it would have guaranteed picked him up the second more and the Aranasi Broodmother, and he could have gone more, more Nether Breath on the follow-up. However, does manage to, you know, play an ooze on the one charge left more glaives. Not too bad. Yeah, and I think the problem with going for the higher value plan 
is you do heal for more, but you still only target one minion with Nether Breath. And True. in that turn, if your opponent then develops even more minions, well, okay, you heal to full, but then you get hit back even harder afterwards. So uh, I do like the uh, using it. Or I'll say on curve, if you know what I mean, <laughs> to, to to just remove the threats as they come, as opposed to trying to save up and get the highest value here. We do see another ooze come down, but suddenly that's one of the uh, biggest bone chew brawls I've seen for a while. <laughs> Makes it very awkward to just drop the nethering because the chewer would survive and get buffed up to four attack. And so we see Fury Hunter respected. I think we're beginning to see a philosophy towards Fury Hunter's lineup building and the way he's approaching these aggressive matchups. We see it from the Druid and from this Quest Warlock that he's not turboing toward quest completion or in the Druid's case, turboing towards getting down the Dragons and the Mount Seller. Rather, he's invested more into the removal package and in this particular case, the weapon removal package and play it more from a control style rather than control in the early game into a big combo. And that's not something I've seen in the way people play these decks so far. So I hope that he can prove to us that this method has potential. Great turn yeah, though. Yeah, whereas looking at Blyze's hand, he looks he looks like he's bothered about controlling Fury Hunter's face because that is just a ton of damage there. Wind slice in hand now, the Volpera can get many different tools that can help out. Even Mana Burn can drastically reduce down what Fury Hunter's response can be uh, as and when he goes for it. But most importantly, Altrius, Volpera, Twin Slice, Second Slice, and Coin is going to deal some damage next turn. Fury Hunter might just be all in on this plot twist. Hefty Shunk, we did see he drew back the Moar, gets the Nether Breath. That is another, and the Ooze. That's incredible amount of healing right there. That is huge. And then... Combo and just reducing another three by getting rid of the weapon. And this is the moment, right? This is the turn Fury Hunter needed. And now his job is to keep control of this and not let Blyze come back into this game because it's very possible with Demon Hunter. Uh, the damage never really ends until the game is over. So it's uh, pretty tough, especially depending on what this full pair of scoundrel offers. Just went straight for the Soul Cleave. I love it. Just looking to get the cheapest cards still fit in the Chaos Strike, I think. Yeah, with the... Yeah. Most importantly, with the Moag down, he heals a lot, which is a big deal because, again, with Demon Hunter, you push a lot of damage, your opponent then heals a bit. The problem is you've also taken a good chunk of damage yourself, and you can just die sometimes, again, if there's just that bit of burst damage from the Warlock. But that's uh, Soul Cleave with the Moag down to put Blizzes all the way back up to 26. Yeah, you make a very good point. A lot of the times towards the late game, Demon Hunter has to go all in and they can't afford to even respect their own health total. But for Fury Hunter, I did see most of the cards expended already. Looks like he's um, hovering towards Dark Skies rather than the Crazed Netherwing. Just make sure that there's no way he dies from his cur current health right. total. He's seen the cane, so the card to it is looking relatively safe. And then yeah. he gets to drop Alex on his own base. Very safe play. I like it. Also, uh, this does set up that he can force kill the Carter mm -hmm. because there's, there's just a weird world in which Blizzer goes metamorphosis, hero power, hero power, dead, right? Uh, but because Fury Hunter has a way to kill off his own Carter, um, uh, even with that soul fire, it means that he can force a heal and not die to the meta. But Fury Hunter takes a victory there. So step one of the series, I guess, for him, done. Getting a win with his Warlock against Blizzer's Demon Hunter. He just needs to do that two more times uh, to be able to take this series in there. I won't even say steal this series away because I think this was, as we mentioned, kind of part of the plan. Whether it's leave Demon Hunter, you know, target Demon Hunter specifically or just target the aggro deck, um, then we'll see if it pays off. But he does have that Druid and most importantly for me, that Mage, which I feel is uh, relatively weak to the Demon Hunter. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about the mage because we were not seeing very much of it in APAC, whereas in EU, you'd have Silver Name bring it week to week for GM. How do you feel about that particular matchup and why would Fury Hunter possibly bring this in a lineup that looks like it's tech towards Demon Hunter? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not the biggest mage fan at the moment. I think that's just eight weeks of casting with Sotol has, <laughs> has definitely uh, helped towards that opinion. Uh, but for me... 
the, the cards are there, right? The, there's heal and AOE removal heal with the, the Kato and the, you know, the Ice Barrier and so on. So the tools are there for Mage. I just don't know if it's consistent enough right. to just actually win a game versus Demon Hunter. I think they can stall, but I think they do need the help of the uh, the big outcomes. I'll, I'll call them for Mage to be able to actually you know win the game and not just die a little bit slower. But we see as we go into that game number four, Fiori Hunter going to keep hold of that Doomsayer throw everything else away. Meanwhile, Flyers has got, I would say, just an okay opening, right? One drop, two drop, three drop is fine. It's just some of these cards are maybe a little bit less powerful versus exactly mage. Yeah. Pretty good curve for Blizzes, as you mentioned. For Fear Hunter, we were seeing so many of the tech choices already come into the hand. We saw the Cobalt Sticky Finger as an option in the Mulligan. It really shows just how much respect Fury Hunter has for Demon Hunter, or rather how much he's trying to prey on its weaknesses. Mage in the late game has theoretically the tools that really put Demon Hunter on the back foot. We keep talking about how Frozen Shadow Weaver is so relevant in the Demon Hunter mirrors to freeze face. Well, if you just stick water elementals, you can consistently freeze face. And he's also just running a Frozen Shadow Weaver, and that top deck is huge. Yeah. I'm very interested to see what Fury Hunter goes for. The natural pick from Mage is, is Wild Growth, if you're not mm -hmm. being, you know, aggro down, and currently no minions on the board's target with, say, yes. Backstab. Um, that does throw him off curve a little bit, but I still think it's correct because he has plenty of stuff to get on with anyway, even if he has to play off curve, because he also doesn't, right? He skips a minion next turn to be able to do a little bit more the turns after, but he goes for Brightwing! That's the one I was least okay. expecting. I was prepared to argue the merits of Animal Companion and just play board for board with the hand that he's got. But I get your point about Wild Growth because the second that he top decks Reno or a big spell with the Dragon Caster, you would much rather have that. But it looks like he's prioritizing just making sure he has a dragon in hand for the Dragon Caster. That's the only reason I would see for Brightwing. Well there's also the, the I think, might have been a consideration as well, is that he might not want to Shadow Weaver on curve because he might not deem it worthwhile when there are some stronger targets maybe later on. So it gives him another option for three drop. But I do think you're right. I think the fact that, yes, Brightwing is a dragon, it will activate Dragoncaster. It yeah. just seems like a... It seems like a stretch because you, you actually have the spell to pay this off with yet, mm -hmm. but there's still a couple of turns, I guess. Yeah, it did actually if the reasoning being if you want a three drop, then why not the companion? However, we also saw Fury Hunter just do a very unusual play against Demon Hunter, which is not freezing the face. He froze the frozen Shadow Weaver, and I would argue got pretty punished for it. I feel like if he had frozen face there, the board state was still in fury hunter's favor yes the 4-3 could have gone fit. if that happens then his bright wing uh sorry his zephyrus could have traded into it and now just got getting that water elemental down another tech card i guess for the aggro matchups and for the weapon matchups especially of course it's a big deal but the problem is blyz already has the board he has ways to push damage he could even funnily enough freeze the water elemental to slow him down a little bit, but he could do that later on to stop the attack. Because the idea is if a water elemental lives and it attacks face once, then it'll forever be able to freeze. Uh, but if he just chooses the turn he wants to open up and then freeze it out, it's going to be good. Looks like he's going to use this to actually clear it up instead. Though. This did present, uh, to be fair to Fury Hunter, a very awkward board for Blizzus to war Gleaves into because um, if he wanted to kill the water elemental without freezing his own face, it would cost him Blyza's entire board. Whereas this way, um, Blyza's just decided to clear it off with some measure of weapons. For Fury Hunter now, though, well, he took the dragon for the dragon caster, so... Yeah. I was looking at the blizzard. Yeah. I was looking at the intellect, actually. Fell out the turn. That also makes sense because it just gives him chances to draw into naturally generated spells, right. but I feel like this pick from Fury Hunter guarantees him something strong to do next turn. Yeah, and this is a certain level of safety, especially when you look at the curve, right? Next turn, Dragoncaster, turn after Siamat, turn after Tortola, and so on, so on. So, um, yeah, I think this just uh, has that certain safety precaution here for Fury Hunter, but... Ready for a show. 
This one's still looking pretty close, as I mentioned. Mage definitely has the capability to repel uh, Demon Hunter aggression, Ooh. but it's whether it has the capability to actually end the game. Because right now, although Fury Hunter's surviving, what, what's the turning point for him? And wow, double glaive bound for two mana? Why not? I was going to say maybe this turn was the window for Fury Hunter to get back because the skull with any most of the other draws would have been locked in the middle. Maybe Blyze would have had to take a turn to play Shadow Weaver before unlocking yeah. the skull. But the top deck one just pushes all of the pressure onto Fury Hunter now. It's not a great board to go for Siamat. He's just going to go on the defensive but still needs a huge payoff spell from the Tortola next turn. Oh, the I beam going to help clear up some of this bone rate as well. And you can just get to this other skull pretty easily as well this uh -huh. turn. Not not to cast this turn, of course, but just to open it up the next turn. And, and look at it. It's insane. What is this? Two Glaive Bounds and a Shadow Weaver. Oh. It's pretty crazy. I think Fury Hunter is on the box plan already off of this Tartolan, and it has to be a healing box. The rarest of boxes. Okay, so there's Ray of Frosts. Okay. So we... Oh, it's not It's not good enough. It's not good enough, is it? I guess, okay, I guess you can win Fury, Rush, see him at, and then Ray of Frost, the one that's left. Uh -huh. But this is, this is, again, just... Just my issue with the matchup is, yes, you, you have ways to survive. But if Yori Hunter's really relying on a box to win him the game, then all the power to him, I suppose. Because good good luck, it's going to be a tough one. Especially now Warglaive's picked oh up. My. I think that Fury Hunter's Lion was hoping to give him more time to draw into another Alex. His Alex draws up, but... And he had seen both Glaive Bounds, so the biggest amount of burst left for Blyzes is, as you can see, this Metamorphosis. Fury Hunter was trying to delay the, as long as possible, but he's going to have to dig for it now. Still not guaranteed to get it from yep. the Dortola. I hope he's been taking some coaching. Silver name. Because it makes him a big. And this is the point, right? We see that he would be dead to the uh, the Warglaives, but he, d he just didn't even think about Nova because it's not good enough to win the game. Mm -hmm. You see Blyze shaking his hand. It's like, no, no, no. no. You know, oh, your favorite card. Grand Slam! <laughs> yes! I mean, he does Hunter's still have that Ray of Frost right. as well. Not dead, but he has to heal because the Metamorphosis hero power yep. and the Warglaives, of course. That's nice, lovely new animation on the uh, portrait when Meta's live as well. Well, that's gonna Doesn't be Doesn't look like good it. enough to me. Lies with the fist pump and with the victory takes another great first step in another Masters Tour that he is no doubt gonna do pretty well in. I'm, I'm already convinced, G. I'm, I'm just I'm just jumping on the hype train already because <laughs> the fact that you know we, we you know we is the first match on stream, but the fact he just won, I'm just like ah, he's just gonna win the whole thing. Uh, unfortunately mean... <laughs> for Fiori Hunter, he does take the loss there. Um, I I saw what his lineup wants to do. Uh, and for his sake, I hope it's good enough. And maybe this was just, you know, oh, okay, you lose some, you, you know, you win some. But for me, it just, the idea just doesn't look strong enough compared to uh, the actual decks he's trying to counter. That if you just bring the good four decks, I think they're just too strong to have this actually work consistently. On the surface, I tend to agree with you. But on the point of Blyzis, I mean, I've heard of three Pete's in traditional and other esports titles, but it just seems so impossible in a game like Hearthstone where you rely on large sample sizes to really see who is the most skilled. And in our um, our general consensus of who are the best players are those who are, you know, lo making lots of top eights. It's not somebody who, you know, spiked one tournament or even right. won two over a long period of time, but just the novelty of possibly having somebody go win three times in a row is completely insane to me.
Yeah, I mean, the mark of a good player is consistency. It's just this consistency seems to be like it might be top <laughs> ones instead of top eight. So uh, this is only round one, of course, of uh, Masters Tour Yon Chipping. There's plenty of Swiss coming up. We're going to be doing five rounds today and four rounds tomorrow and then top eight on Sunday. So there's tons of Hearthstone to be played out and viewed by you guys at home. So we hope you're enjoying it so far. This was just our first match of the round and we'll be covering uh, some more matches from round one right after a very short break. We'll be right back with some more Masters Tour, Yon Chipping. Rusted Legion, forward! Oh, 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 oh. Can you hear the thunder in the distance? Over four weeks, spanning five stages, Fellfire Festival includes a lineup guaranteed to sizzle your grizzle. Week one, in Bob's big amphitheater, pirates are invading battlegrounds. A brand new minion class is here to swab your deck, along with 15 new minions and three new heroes. And they won't just be at the Fellfire Festival for one show, they'll be here forever. Week two in the first era core pavilion. The one, the only, Alana Starseeker takes the stage in a brand new solo adventure, Trial by Fellfire. See your honor face off against Mecha Jaraxxus and the Rusted Legion. Your doom awaits. While she's here, she'll be throwing down with the pirates over in the battlegrounds as a fourth playable hero. What? What did he just say? Then we kick it old school for a special command performance guaranteed to burn your crusade. Charging in week three are the Trial by Hellfire Challenges. We live the hits and slashes, such as Kill Boss. You will not prevail. MacDaradon. And Lady Marge! Co-headlining in week three is the baddest brawl to ever blast them all! Oh, no! The return of the burn dog! We've added new weapons to hack, slash, and crush your opponent! And speaking of weapons, week four on the Rusted Chainsaw stage! You want to be part of the Rusted Legion? Well, you get your chance when you enter the Rumble Dome! Choose a henchman, grab a weapon, and battle for a spot next to Mecha Jaraxxus himself! The glory will be yours! As will Tetanus! Whatever. For all attendees of the Fellfire Festival of Music and Vengeance, Vengeance, you will have the chance to earn numerous rewards the likes of which Outland has never seen! For all the details, check out the festival flyer! Make it your desktop background! Print it! Get a nice frame and hang it on your wall! Just keep it handy! It's got everything you need to know for joining us at the Fellfire Festival of Music and Vengeance! I should never have taught you to self-promote. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Masters Tour here at Yongshiping. As you can see, the sights of Sweden all around me. <laughs> and I am with Darak for the first time in a long time, and it's good to be back with you, Darak. How are you doing? It is indeed. Couldn't have been a more fitting opening to a, a disaster of a caster duo in me and you, Lorinda. But I think 
aside from that, I just can uh, I can't overstate how excited I am to get into this weekend. Already having seen, unfortunately, Fury Hunter fall down to the the pure might of Blizzes as he is uh, on a good start to get that three-peat victory. And uh, just all across the board, the excitement is palpable, Neil. Yeah, I've been flicking just through the one and O's. It's a bit ridiculous to even pull names out. There's 350 players, so half of 350 is, I don't know, 300 or something. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of people winning games who we know. Papa Jason, Staz, PNC have all won their first match of the day. Oh. All recently relegated, all looking to try and get back up there. And honestly, with so many of them now having been relegated, 15 Grandmasters have been relegated over the, the three seasons. Yeah. Um, but never really had that big result. So Lion, a big favourite, and she's already off to a 1-0 lead. Yeah, looking very, very strong. And like you said, doing the thing that a lot of our past world champions have done, where they get a good result, but then uh, follow it up very well as well. You know, we saw it with Pavel, uh, in particular Firebat as well. Uh, very long storied history and Lion uh, following up with a very strong performance at last time Master Tour in Indonesia or uh, Los Angeles or whatever it ended up being titled. But for now, Neil, this is uh, one of those matchups that I know about more in theory than actual practice because uh, overcasting Grandmasters haven't actually got to see much Warrior, to be perfectly honest, because it's just banned a whole lot. So already a very interesting strategy from Lion. Yeah, you're in very good hands here, though, because I can lose this from both sides. So I can explain <laughs> what not to do on both sides of the equation. And honestly, it's almost all about can the warrior do lots of damage before seven mana occurs. And so making the egg, inner-raging it, rampaging it, getting Whoa. a huge chunk of damage into the druid's face what? is a really good-looking start for, for Dennis here. Yeah, it already looked absolutely insane. Uh, Lion's uh, strategy of holding on to the overgrowth in the Mount Cellar is one I'm a big fan of. I think that Mount Cellar is a card that still to this day is not kept enough in the mulligan when you have the overgrowth. It's really just like Demon Hunter and I guess Highland the Hunter, they're a little bit too aggressive uh, to be holding back uh, the Mount Cellar in the Kai hand. But right here, I absolutely love it. Yeah, and you hear me squealing in the background because Battle Rage being picked up Okay, it doesn't look fantastic, but in three or four turns time, Dennis will still have a turn or so to get more cards, and when you start making six eights and big things, Druid does not like it. And we can also see Lion hasn't actually got any really good activators for the Mount Cellar. Obviously, they will come from the Overflow, but she might just be dead. Yeah, having to go Innovate Overgrowth, is it, it's fine. It's what you want to do with the deck is to ramp up, but at the moment, you make a good point. It's all just looking that little bit too slow. Overgrowth on six here, which is inevitably going to be the play. Setting up for the overflow. As it currently stands, Chavo's going to have drawn half his deck and basically killed her by that point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the dream for the warrior. The, the druid doesn't have a dream. It just does the thing that it does. Um, the dream, actually, for the druid is looking at Wicked Goods Twitter. He's published mm. the deck distribution. And Druid has won the race for third place with over 70% of people bringing it. Wow. So this deck we're going to see a lot of today. We are indeed. It is interesting, isn't it? Because traditionally it kind of felt like uh, the decidedly fourth deck. You know, it's the one you put in at the end after you decided on Rogue or Warlock as your third one just to kind of fill it up. Uh, but here a lot of people saying uh, they think it's good enough just to be in their lineup with uh, most of the players going for it at this point. Just laughing at this battle rage. Yeah, it might still be the fourth <laughs> deck, but different people can't decide on the third deck, if that makes sense. Because yeah. Rogue and Warlock is a really weird pairing, That's good to point. me at least. So even though it's the third most popular, it could still be the fourth deck. Although we are seeing weird, weird bands across the board. Having watched probably more GM than you, <laughs> in some ways lurking, <laughs> waiting to get my chance to cast. Um, I'm sure you have. Watching for the stats. Just not seeing other bands from Warrior and Demon Hunter has been... Yeah, this is going to be refreshing today from that. It will. But now, finally, Lion has set up the power turn in the next couple of turns. Be it the Glowfly, if she finds a Soul of the Forest, or, I suppose, more likely, the Exotic Mount Cellar. She is ready to go with her power turn. Interestingly enough, though, she deems the Risky Skipper dangerous enough to kill it on this turn with the Bog Beam. 
Do you think that's an overreaction or is that just too crucial against the Druid? So normally I would say that you'd want to keep it back for sure because the Skipper's just not enough damage to matter and the card draw damage has been done. But I think this time around it makes sense. She's got plenty to do on the next turn anyway. Yeah. Uh, making space in her hand and that's going to pay off as well, picking up the, the second draw. So. Oh yes, that's a great point. The Fungal Fortunes does help. She needs to find, however, Iron Bark, Bog Beam, Innovate, Moonfire, any of these cheap spells <laughs> in order to flesh out this turn. And there we go. That Those is going to help you a mean. lot. Yeah, exactly. Innovate would have been nice, obviously, but this is where the Warrior has one last attempt, or it loses the game. Is how this normally goes down now. A little bit awkward with the health totals. I guess you're probably looking at. Moonfire face? I don't know. Do you even want to preemptively damage anything, or does that just make it better for your opponent in terms of, like, blood boil brute nonsense? Yeah, I think it makes it better. I think that's part of the reason she got rid of the skipper last turn. Mm, true. Because uh, getting a brute down on top of some other bits and pieces would have been irritating. Uh, realistically now... I think you, yeah, you just call it how you see it. You make things and you kill things. Oh. I know that sounds really <laughs> straightforward, but yeah. 25% chance of getting at least one Griffin if you've made four beasts, so nothing ridiculous there. Pretty likely, pretty likely. And also, it's worth mentioning that Zixor was nice on that turn, but it always has the added benefit of getting Zixor Prime. Uh, probably not going to be much of a factor here, because I think the game is won or lost by that point anyway most of the time. But if she can get it off the top in the next couple of turns, that could be a game changer. Yeah, definitely worth something to keep an eye on for the whole day. As he says, all the words in the wrong order. You can tell I'm bad. <laughs> um, the, the real problem here for Dennis, apart from the, the obvious, is that there's <laughs> another mount seller. He could yeah. probably wangle away to get rid of this board. But there's going to be another one if he even manages it. Yeah, well, while there is bad news, undoubtedly, the good news, which seems to far outweigh, is that he can draw six cards for two mana, should he so desire. Yep, and he might <laughs> well find more rampages, which would be a useful deal. Great point, yeah. And also this, as you're always looking to do with Warrior, I feel like, it gives you the very, very strong backup win condition of an OTK. Grom plus Inner Rage ready to go on turn 8 now. And uh, as soon as a uh, Bloodsworn Mercenary is found as well, it could just be Corkron Inner Rage Bloodsworn on turn 7 instead. Even more damage. Yeah, that's, that's always the good one because it's sort of out of the blue and something we haven't mentioned actually is no weapons for Dennis all game when you're trying to mm. deliver chunky damage it's great to have your massive egg hitting them in the face but a weapon back up with some some lackeys chipping in is actually a big deal in this matchup that is quite close in terms of can you do the damage in time now though Neil the, the first one was the prep that was the setup Mount Seller right. this is the main course now with uh, the second skipper down on the board she can kill that off very easily in a couple of different ways and once that has been dealt with this big big board that can be made with Mount Seller is going to be significantly harder to deal with yeah picking up the inner I mean as if it wasn't enough picking up the innovate was a decent oh, deal man. there but because this is turn seven Lion thinks she can't be wiped out, and she might well be right. Yeah, I mean, this is the difference, right? Generally, the uh, Fungal Fortunes is not the way you want to go in the matchup. Obviously, slight mistake there in terms of she could have buffed it up for one more attack mm -hmm. and got another Needle off the Porcupine. But the main point of the turn is that with both Risky Skippers gone, this board is tough as all hell to get rid of. And maybe it on its own could be enough to win the board for the rest of the game. Yeah, you should take 13 here if you just in a rage up the corker and copy it, for instance. Yeah. Um, if you had the cards to do that, that would also help. Uh, but she has to expect those to be available. But actually, that's likely close to the maximum. Which means on this turn, uh, Chabo Dennis could just go for Live Wire Lance and Corkron to the face and say, you know what, this game is slipping out of my hands. Uh, let's try and just get the win on the following turn. Yeah, the thing is, he's on 48, so he, we can see he's probably not actually dead next turn. Yeah, he's very, like very unlikely. Savage Raw board, but, but he doesn't know that. That's the problem. Because Lion's kind of half-bluffed this. 
she knew she could afford to make this big board, which would challenge the next board from Dennis. And she's relying on Dennis wow. just taking it down. Whereas actually, if he just wedged it all to the face and ignored these, he would probably have survived and probably get lethal with Grom the turn after. Exactly, and these are the two big lines you have. You fight for board, or you can just go all face. The punishes on the other side, crystal power, not enough on its own. Line would need something extra. Overflow, not enough on its own. She'd need something extra. Something like crystal power plus iron bark, which is exactly what she has here. <laughs> so uh, good for Dennis, I suppose, that he is fighting for board in one aspect. But to look at it from another lens, he's trying to fight against the board that is getting bigger every single turn and is not slowing down. Yeah, and she, I think I just think Lion pulled an amazing move there. I think that she yeah. she basically tricked. She did a human play as opposed to a technical play, which is I know that Dennis is going to try and kill these minions, mm. and he won't kill them all, and I will then be able to use the remaining minions to wipe up his board while messing around with my mount sellers and making things. Mm. As it did happen though, <laughs> looking at the hand, she did draw that second savage draw, so maybe maybe it wasn't too bad for Dennis in the long run anyway. But it looks pretty bad now. It really does. Again, both the skippers down. Well, go on then, Warrior. Do that thing you do where you, you clear up all the board and then kill them. Yeah, exactly. Dennis has now used the Inner Rage, both copies of Inner Rage, at this point after the egg play at the start of the game. So the actual OTK potential is significantly diminished at this point. Must burn yeah, th when you get to this point and your opponent plays any taunt... Yeah. Just stuff starts getting really bad. Because you don't have to just deal with the taunts, and you don't have actually that many attacking minions. They all want to hit in the face if you're going to win. Right. So even the 3-4 the is just in the way, and you can't get it out of the way without... Yeah, especially with no skippers. It's just doom. Yeah. And this really does just speak back again to his last turn, which was the turning point, in my opinion, of the matchup when he decided to fight for board instead of just shooting everything to the base. No matter which way you break it down, he's playing around different cards with each of the different plays. If he goes with this line of clearing the board, he's praying that VK line does not have any way to develop the board, and he can just win through that way. If he goes with the other line, he's praying that she doesn't have healing. But I think overall, it was just worth the risk of having the outright win on the following turn if she didn't have the defense. The Druid, when it gets past turn 7, has just too much card draw and too much defense Yeah. Um, to take that. As it happens, I think he would have lost anyway because the second Savage I think draw so was too. drawn. I, ha I haven't added it up. Maybe he had enough health, but I don't think so. But I, I would rather he had gone face there as well, just because they're always making another board, so you need to be able to just get a little bit lucky and kill them with a Grom. Exactly, which means that Lion, our former world champ, or current world champ, I should say, at least for the moment, is now 2-0 up against Chabba Dennis, looking to get that first win on the table. And uh, although it's a, a slightly different qualification process, of course, given that the Chinese scene does not have uh, Grandmasters directly, it's still just a big deal in uh, proving that she deserves her spot and cementing herself as one of the all-time greats uh, when you throw down that title. Yeah, I do love it when a world champion comes out fighting and proves their worth, despite the fact they're the world champion the next year. Uh, Hunter Ace kind of didn't need to, even though he tried, because he did it the year yeah. before. But Pavel, Lion, Oskaka... Actually, Oskaka did it the year before as well, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> these, these players, I love it when they come out fighting and prove it over and over again. And yeah, Lion top eight last Masters Tour? They're all sort of getting a bit jumbly now. But... Yes, last one. Correct. And... Yeah, already. Okay, it's the first round and she hasn't won it yet, but on, on route to at least starting off well again today. Yeah, a very strong start. And with her last deck being Demon Hunter, Neil, I very much like her chances of going all 3-0, or at the very least taking the third win, because Warrior, I think, is the one bad matchup left for Demon Hunter. Uh, even uh, when I was saying on ladder, you know, oh man, I'm having a good matchup with Demon Hunter against Warrior. Maybe it's just kind of good. I got shouted at by you and Sottle saying, you're just high rolling. Stop saying that. It's a terrible matchup for the Demon Hunter. But it aside is. from that, the Druid and the Hunter, I think, should be very, very good for Lion. Uh, it is something we should keep an eye out on today, though, the Demon Hunter Warrior. The Demon Hunters have learned how to play that matchup. It's still mm. a terrible matchup. I'm not going to defend you ever on your stupid comment. <laughs> but the Demon Hunters have learned that it's not all about hitting you with a 2-2 in the face on turn 2. Yeah, It's about all that mid-range nonsense. If you can line it all up in, an, in a row, present two or three big turns in a row into the Warrior, you can get it done. 
Yeah. Give the warrior nothing to put their weapons into. Give the warrior nothing injured to make their minions cheaper, and it can work. But yeah, it's a bad matchup, as we're probably going to see here. Yeah, Dennis going with uh, his best shot at taking a single win on the table. You want to say that you've won a game of Hearthstone against the world champion. That's at least a very cool story. And uh, with Battlefiend, Umberwing, Overseer, it's looking like it's going to be a tough start for him, to say the least. But his hand is no slouch in its own right. Yeah, you're looking for one card, in my opinion, in this. Well, you're looking for two, Ankar and Corsair Cash, but one can yeah. lead to the other. Um, hitting three minions in a row with your weapon is just so powerful. And actually, the Sky Raider's not that bad either, believe it or not. Just is an annoying distraction that saves you one or two health. Yeah, it just makes it a little bit more awkward for your opponent. If they have to use a twin slice a little bit earlier on, the ramifications don't become clear immediately, but it's just these small, subtle advantages that you're getting it for yourself. So I fully agree with the keep from Dennis. Yeah, I'm going to start playing Mad Bomber in my warrior, I think. <laughs> just ping on my own minions, mm. wipe my opponent minions out. What is there not to like, apart from huge chunks of RNG? You're taking a pure, beautiful deck, Neil, and sullying it with your nonsense of RNG. That's what I like to do. I like to put my own <laughs> stamp on decks. Indeed. But now for VK Lion. We, we are presented with a somewhat interesting uh, debate here that I'm seeing more and more. Because generally, the way that you want to play Demon Hunter, the thought has been, if you have a hand like this, you want to go Overseer and then coin Warglaives. Whoa, that sounds amazing, making a whole bunch of tutus thereafter. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing a little bit more of a whispering amongst the top Demon Hunter players that you a lot of the time want to go for it the other way, where you go coin Warglaives and then play the uh, Overseer afterwards, which you've saved until after that point. Not sure it's necessarily that crucial in this matchup with uh, Risky Skipper playing a big part, but it's at least something to consider. Yeah, I actually quite like that if you can get rid of a Skipper with all your early bits and pieces. And mm. just thinking about Twitter there where somebody says, oh, Lorinda will say bits and pieces. Yep. Well done, hey, you. you got ding, me. Ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even deliberate. But maybe this isn't enough to force those out of the hand. Hmm. Mm. And so maybe you don't get to play the, the Satyr until... Well, you, maybe you have to play it before the Warglaves at some point. Yeah, well, with the way it's currently standing, I agree. You're probably just looking to play out this hand on curve, get as much damage at the start, and do the classic play of, oh, I really, really hope they don't have Armor Smith, and then they always do and you lose. The other one that works... Yeah, they, they always do. I don't know how that happens, because I never have it. The other one that can <laughs> work here is if Lion can pick up a Skull... Mm. If she can pick up a skull and go with the altruist, then that can just win the game in one turn, and the rest of it just doesn't matter. Or they have Armorsmith. Oh, Armorsmith's looking a bit lonely out there at the moment, though. Definitely not going to get much use out of it for a while. Yeah, exactly. Live wire lance is uh, not really what you're looking for, uh, ideally. You do want that Ankar, like you said, to go Ankar with the Risky Skipper as well. But it's just board control for the moment, and eventually, for Dennis, I think you'll be able to get some kind of a value out of the armor smith. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that people who are new to this deck get wrong. You don't need, although it's nice, to get 15 damage or 15 armor from two armor smiths. Yeah. Three or four can be plenty. You, you try to maximize, but it just doesn't have to be huge. The Demon Hunter is built to do 30 damage to you. That's why I-Beam is so good in the mirror. There was some uh, reasoning to get a little bit fancy there and go for like the Alex Straza to heal back up uh, after you've taken a lot of damage. But I think generally against Demon Hunter, just taking the cheapest option is a very safe and secure mm -hmm. route. Yeah, if you get to turn nine, you usually win as the warrior. Because then even your hero power starts to get rid of half of what they're doing. Ooh. Difficult choice now. Does he want to just switch this? Yeah, it's actually really tempting, isn't it? This hand becomes so, so, so much better with a Risky Skipper next turn. It's it's unbelievable. Just gives him such an awful turn this turn, and killing the 2-2 two -two and making a Twilight Drake is so tempting, but if you want to Armorsmith, you've got to switch to this anchor now. Hmm. If you want to win by, by beating your opponent in the face, that's fine, but if you want to win by armor, you need to switch immediately. He could swing and then equip it to swing next turn. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, 
I like it, just getting the swing now. Guaranteeing yourself the Risky Skipper for the following turn, given that he's already played one Sky Raider. It's a big sacrifice, but I think it's correct. I do too. And we're saying about not getting much armor, but just literally Risky Skipper, Bomb Wrangler, Armorsmith in not that order is probably enough. Oof. And uh, Dennis is going to be very, very happy that he made the swing on that turn, because mm. had he not, we would be looking at face frozen here and potentially no Risky Skipper available. But now the options on this turn just completely open up. Lion just chose to go face there. She did have the chance to kill the 1-5. I wonder if that will come back and bite her or if the damage will be enough. I think she's saying the damage will win the game next turn. I think this is very smart from Lion. Uh, at this point, the game is quite clearly looking to slip away very soon unless she hits Skull of Gul'dan. Mm -hmm. So the best way to win the game is to save everything for a massive altruist on the following turn and just pray that that gets there. It's enough at the moment, I think. Conundrum. In the face of this armorsmith? In the face of the armorsmith, it's not, no. Right, right, sorry. Yeah. For where she <laughs> sat, it's enough. So Yes. I forgot you young kids with your actual <laughs> technically correct things. Hmm. Power shoot will help as well. Brigadian. Yes, exactly. Brigand Brigadian. <laughs> Just an extra minion to armor up with. So if you go for trade in Risky Skipper Armorsmith, that means that you will have five damaged minions. So Blood World Brute costs two, so you can get it down. You can't play the second one, though, I believe, because it would still cost two after a couple minions die. In the end, though, just decides to go with the uh, Bomb Wrangler, which makes and sense. That... The Blood Boil Brute oh, can be usable next turn. I was in the process of saying, and that will win the game, and it probably will, but Ooh. Lion does pick up the one card she needed to stay in this. I mean, this whole game turns around now. It was looking to be altruist for a few cards, give your opponent a whole load of armor and probably just die. So now all of a sudden, she can just set up for the mother of all turns next turn. Dennis, we should point out there, had the chance to play that brute that we both liked, but because he played the Bomb Wrangler, Altruist is a lot mm. more messy than it was. Great point. It's just lovely when you go for the Altruist and it blows up on the bomb on the first pick. Yeah. So that was actually quite a nice little play there from Dennis. Obviously correct to take out the armor smith there to deny any extra armor, but for Lion... As it currently stands, she doesn't have the mana to re-equip Warglaive's next turn if she wants to go for the big Altruist turn with I-Beam and the Blazing Battle Mage and all of that. See what she does go for. She, we, she showed with a Druid that she's not yeah. scared to push her the timing until the last possible minute. Mm. And again, she's just sort of taking a turn to do nothing here and this is alarm bells for Dennis. I don't know if it's just me, but the first thing I do here is press, press the armor button so I don't forget to, because this smells. Something's going right. on. Because it's not the only thing to consider here is protecting your own health total. It's also about right. setting up for the win, if you can, on the following turn. Uh, because again, like you said, he should be expecting an altruist turn now. I think anything else doesn't really get, get there at the, anymore for Lion. And so playing the second Bomb Wrangler... Conundrum looks fairly tempting to me even though you have the skipper on board yeah it's really weird because you can't play nothing well you can play nothing but then you're giving mm. lion a lot of time and yeah i like yeah. this for the same reason as the like the first one after i saw what happened Whoa. <laughs> and that actually just happens to set up lethal in the meantime as well it does which means all of us close to it while Lion could have tried to potentially take a slow turn by just setting up the Warglaives, taking out the Bomb Wrangler so that she's less likely to lose her Altruist on the big turn, all of a sudden now the pressure is too high. Yep. And that's something that you've got to do as the warrior. You've got to put them under pressure or the Demon Hunter. It just keeps finding stuff. It's really irritating. Yeah. It just draws a card and hits you for two or something horrible. Ugh. Bad Demon Hunter, bad. So it, looked like, it looks like she is trying to delay that Altruist turn 
just for one longer by setting up the Warglaves here instead and freezing yep. the Drake. Looks like she doesn't think quite correctly that she can do 22 in a turn without some help from right. some minions on the board. So, oh, here she goes, because she's got the... Uh, oh, she wants to put minions down before the bomb to give the Altus less chance of being hit. It's very smart. I thought he was just going to straight up nuke Altus immediately there, but just ruin all the planning, because that's what normally happens. Yeah, that's bad. Oh, fantastic outcomes there for Lion. A lot of people would have lost that turn. A lot she's of people. She's turned would. it round. Yeah, myself included. I oh yeah, yeah, I'm including myself firmly in that, in that lot of people. Yeah, that's projection on my part. Okay, far from over, however, for Dennis, the Warmall Challenger can be used to take out the. Uh... Whoa, how do you want to do it? I guess take out the four one with the Warmall Challenger, yeah, and then. Yep. Trade in the blood boil brute into Altruist. You're still alive. You're still knocking about at the moment. Yeah, and you've got another brute coming, an armor smith, the sky raider. I'm going to read out the names of the cards live on air. There you go. Um, but that's a decent looking hand to both survive and to put some attack down. But I hear you mooing in the background. Six, 11, 14. As I count this, Lion is one damage off lethal. She cleans up, realizes weakness in terms of board control. Dennis struggled to clear off the last board, so she's gonna he's gonna struggle to clear off this one as well. Yeah, this time. Oh, hang on. I was gonna say this time it's looking over, but from where he sat, obviously from where we're sat, it is over. From where he sat, he can do some shenanigans now with the mercenary. Yeah, Clean I mean, on the board, best... get the armor smith. It's nice. The best chance I feel like is just hoping to hit Risky Skipper off of this Sky Raider. Mm -hmm. Everything else I just don't think gets there, to be honest. I mean, double brute killing the 6 4 and the 4 1 isn't too bad. Sure. From where he sat, again, not from where we're sat, where things look a bit sad. Someone's got to lead the charge. But yeah, he's identified what you've identified. Nope, not enough. Oh, that's so pretty close. good. <laughs> it's pretty good. But I just don't think it's going to be quite enough against the Metamorphosis available to come down for line on the following turn. And I've got to say, what a first game for our world champion. That was very, very smart Demon Hunter play, taking an unfavorable win. Indeed, and from an unfavorable position for half the game as well. Mm. But the timing on the Altruist, the, the risk removal in terms of how the bombs are going to work out. Everything there was lovely, and she goes to 1-0, and you're not going to be wanting to be playing our world champion any time in this tournament, the form she's on. You are not, unfortunately for Chabo Dennis, unable to even take a single game there, despite playing Warrior a few times. Didn't get to see the first game, of course, but that does mean that it's a fantastic start for Lion. She's looking to be able, potentially, to get another top eight here, if she's able to carry things on well. And I think I blame you for that. You're the one saying, Chabo Dennis would just be delighted. He'll take a game off the world champion. He'll be happy to tell his mates. And he didn't. But yeah, he's well, I mean... He's a world champion somewhere before. He's been around quite a while. He's still lost to a world champion. That's still kind of a story. <laughs> if I'd lost to a world champion of anything, I would uh, let everyone know. But I've actually beaten a world champion in a, a mage mirror in uh, Las Vegas. Take that, Hunter Ace. I'm dunking you on air. Wow. Looks on... You, I Have guess. you beaten any GMs? Ooh, wow. Okay, that 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 is a little bit much. <laughs> but then now, for our next game, we have another story of a player that we can dunk on about former GMness. It is going to be Fino Mino, obviously representing T1, up now against Language Hacker, and it was uh, kind of a switcheroo for these two players last year. Fino, obviously, in a pretty heartbreaking fashion, was relegated out of Grandmasters and uh, still. Very much a part of the Hearthstone community, a very beloved pillar of our community here. But Language Hacker at the same time was able to very deservedly qualify through to, gra to Grandmasters. Yeah, and Fino, for all of his bolster and bluster about, will I play Mage every single day to entertain my viewers? <laughs> and I don't care, and I'm not going to try and win Hearthstone tournaments, and I'll just bring puzzle boxes. Not a Mage to be seen. 
Yeah, I mean, Fino can say whatever he wants. He tries to be the cool guy, but he really does care. I don't care what he says about it. He wants to win. And uh, despite the fact that I think he's been a little bit deflated, maybe fallen that little bit out of love with competitive Hearthstone as of late since his fall from Grandmasters, if he's able to uh, turn things around here, I think we'll see that spark reignited within him. Yeah, I think when he won one of the last tour stops in 2018, after being so close two or three times, like, not just himself, but everybody, like, erupted. It's like, thank goodness he's finally got it done. I know. And yeah, yeah. he wants to be back. Don't Going with the play of... Uh, yeah, exactly. Coin Fungal Fortunes on one, quite clearly to find the Breath of Dreams, given that he already has the dragon in hand, uh, is not rewarded with it as it currently stands. But while this hand is very lacking at the moment, it's very, very close to a nutty hand. Yeah, these hands turn into nutty hands incredibly fast. And with no altruists available for language hacker, just the glow flies might be enough if Fino keeps it under control until turn five. That was a like the old school way. Yeah. I want to point out as well from language hacker, that was a very, very clever play, in my opinion, of holding back on the Sator Overseer on that turn. Because when your opponent's gone Coin Fungal into Fungal, the chances of them having Bog Beam or Moonfire Hero Power or Crystal Power to take it out on turn three are incredibly high. It is not surviving if you play it on that turn. Whereas here, he realizes the weak point of Druid. The predictability is they have to play Overgrowth on turn four here to have any chance. So not only does he play his most threatening minion on this turn, he also mana burns down so he can't even play it. Uh, little does he know Fino's hand is so bad he couldn't have played it even if he wanted to. Uh, but it's a very, very smart play from Language Hacker. Yeah, for the people who say they know they never make any mistakes in Hearthstone, okay, you might play your cards in the right order and not make technical mistakes, but you don't yeah. see those sort of plays until you watch the top players. The ones who have thought about the matchup so deeply that, hang on, on this turn, this exact situation is relevant. And look at the difference it's made. Absolutely. I mean, Glowfly Swarm on this turn is incredibly powerful as it is, as overstated of the stats Bosch. of what you're getting. It, it, he's just dead. Language he's Hacker just... just has lethal to bring us all the way to Game 5. Well, we hope you enjoyed that Game 4, Phil, everybody. That took at least a minute. I loved that. I thought that was a I loved great it demonstration it cool. from Language Hacker of how to play the matchup and to use your tech cards correctly. No, I agree entirely. That was actually really cool. I also thought from Fino, it was very well played on the other side. Coin Fungal Fortunes is not something you see very often. And uh, although he was not rewarded with a Breath of Dreams or an Overgrowth, he was extremely likely to find it at that point. Yeah, he was. There was the option there that he could have saved the coin for those Glowflies and just taken the chance. True, yeah. I, I there wouldn't have been had... that many, but 2-2 two, two square off well against Demon Hunters. It's true. I don't think he had the uh, fungal, sorry, the glowfly swarm in hand on turn one. Oh, okay. I, think I he thought drew he had it one. after I he might be wrong. Uh, Again, then, then maybe yes. wrong. If that was no, then, the case, yes. then I think it's more debatable. But for sure, it was a, a interesting way to play it, not the usual way. Yeah, and you see that a lot when you when you're watching the top. I want to say hundred. That number obviously pulled straight out of my backside. Um, <laughs> but around the top hundred players, you start to see very different plays being made to the very strong players who are sort of the Agreed. top 500. Yeah, I, I truly believe Language Hacker to be uh, up there with the best of them in America's GM. It, it goes into what Monsanto is saying, where he believes that EU has been dethroned as the strongest region this last season of Grandmasters, with the, the field for Americas getting much, much stronger with the inclusion of our new GMs like uh, Language Hacker and Empanizado. I can't agree with that. I think that Europe <laughs> is still clearly the best region. I'm not. Yeah, that's. I mean, you're laughing, but I'm not even joking. I think that's actually the case. Obviously, I mean, you're right, Neil. I just wanted to humour him, but it was I an interesting we... talking point, nonetheless. See, the thing is, they don't get many chances to have a, a pop at me. They can pop at you if you <laughs> so If I say something, I can go missing for a few months again and just pretend it never got said. Pavel what? has gone to one and zero, by the way. Another Ooh. XGM trying to find his way back. That would be a very cool story. Both XGM and X Grand Masteries, the, the double barrel, double combo. Uh, but now in the Druid versus Quest Warlock, this is a matchup that has uh, very much been 
uh, back and forth in the Hearthstone community. And Fino himself has been pretty instrumental in dictating how that perception has shifted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with those show matches with RDU demolishing the, the Warlock. Yeah. Um, who, by the way, RDU hasn't brought the Druid today. He's brought the Warlock just to really <laughs> <laughs> mess with everybody. Um, but yeah, the, the perception is that the Druid is favoured, I think. Because yeah. it gets to do what it likes for so long. Yeah, exactly. I, I think if you hit any kind of ramp, you're looking to be in a tremendous spot. And Fino clearly understanding the matchup very well. I mean, it's not especially complicated, but the overgrowth in the Mount Cellar, exactly what you want in the starting hand. Even uh, vating or coining out the overgrowth there allows him to get the ramp rolling even quicker and get the proper value out of these Mount Cellars. Yeah, so Swarm into Swarm seems okay. Yeah. But he's just going to go straight into Mount Cellar mode. It was a tough call there because you've just seen the uh, the Craze Netherwing there. Mm -hmm. And so the, what you're trying to deny, or at least play around on the following turn, is Abyssal Summoner. And I would say Glowfly played around that very, very well. Uh, even if your opponent has a decent answer in Moag, Reign of Fire, or the second Craze Netherwing, it at the very least stops them from doing their best play on curve. Uh, but I guess this does as well, actually, to be fair. The Mount Cellar kind of has to die. Yep. And it's going to be awkward. It depends what he's trying to stick. He obviously wants to normally... 95% plus percent of the time wants to stick a Mount Cellar, obviously. Yeah. But with this specific hand... It wasn't quite so clear-cut, weirdly enough. Right, yeah. A lot of clunky stuff going on there. But yeah, I'm still surprised. Uh, like you say, he's going to... However he chooses to do it, four turns in a row, Language Hack is going to have to clear the board. Indeed. And now Fino, yeah. Hmm. The Ysera on this turn does make a lot of sense. We're just looking at hand dump, into overgrowth, into dragons, into mount cellar. There are plenty of threats to come for the next four or five turns minimum. For Fino. Language Hacker getting close to completing the quest. That's when we start having to really watch what he's drawing. Right. Just hit the right zero drop. And I don't just mean Maligos, so that's obviously the, the, the poster child of the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of big ones, right? Keladan to be defensive. Uh, Twisting Nether, if he can plot twist that back in, is a very big one as well. Uh, but also just every piece of burn you get, Soul Fire, Nether Breath, even Rain of Fire, can get you that little bit closer to getting a surprise lethal on the Druid. Yeah, it's never a surprise when it happens to you. It's, you don't know how it's going to happen, that's the surprise. Mm. The fact you're dead is never a surprise, because the first card they draw is always amazing. Mind you, this 9-9 nine -nine is also much more awkward than it first appeared. Oof. And taking Fino, damage it, is relevant, right? Yeah, it's just about choosing what he wants to get rid of here. Uh, I'm a little surprised to see him playing out the excess mana mm -hmm. there. I was kind of anticipating him to go uh, for just the overgrowth into trying to dump cards and save the excess mana for Mount Cellar. But the upside of this is, of course, that he can get immediate dragons to fight back on the board. Yeah, that shows you what he's thinking. It shows you that he doesn't... Because I felt the same as you. I'd hold it and then do it all the next mm. turn and get this, this ridiculous board. But he's feeling it's more urgent than we're feeling. He's feeling that he's dead really soon, so needs to start fighting back immediately. Yeah, I mean, his next few turns are undeniably clunky. Glowfire there was only getting, what, four minions uh, onto the board, which is really not very impressive. Yeah. It's a weird card in the Dragon variant. In fact, the whole deck's kind of weird because none of the cards make sense. It's just Mount Cellar and some ramp, and the other cards you just auto-complete. Yeah. <laughs> so I've just got so much disdain for Druid. One day you'll learn. Maybe. Ooh. Ooh. Zero mana, Rain of Fire. It is a uh, deceptively powerful card to get for zero mana, I would say. It's obviously not the dream when you compare it to Malagos, but it can get you that little bit closer to just getting lethal in the next few turns, which Language Hacker is clearly yeah. prioritizing. Look at this play. Yeah, I started adding while you were talking there, just in case we'd somehow missed a lethal, because <laughs> that was so aggressive. I didn't think it was, don't get me wrong, but when he was just suddenly going absolutely mm. nuts there, 
All right, clear the board. Heal back up. Draw your dragon. This is the game plan now for Fino, and it is going to give him, at the very least, a strong grip on this board. Yeah, Hack is going to be under some pressure to get this done soon. But get it so done soon, he really might. Gonna overdraw the next card. That can be relevant, given that he he's likely to see most of his deck in this game. Interesting. One thing I will say here is that Fino is playing with his cheap spells very, very aggressively. Ooh. But when Malagos is overdrawn for Language Hacker, how much that matters changes drastically. That's insane. Ooh. And now Language Hacker's got to find a way to get lethal like in the next two turns and some of it's got to go face. So he'll want to look so to get his minions out now. Because the last damage is going to have to go over the top of a wide, wide board of taunts that he yeah. can't deal with. He does have Twisting Nether, but he can't do anything with it until he's tapped a couple of times. Yeah, well the game plan is I think that he wants to go for... Nether plus a zero mana uh, minion that he's got off the tap in the last couple mm -hmm. turns. And uh, I mean, that's quite clearly the game plan because he's just sinking more of his damage into minions now despite going face in the last couple turns. Yeah, you had to change course completely just to make space for an attempt to tap into something to play alongside yep. Dragon Queen. Very clean play for Fino. He's seen a whole bunch of removal start to come down. Now is the time to try and stick. This Glowfly Swarm, but already there for Hacker, there's the answer. Bye-bye, <laughs> Glowflies. Yep. And really, at this point, when, when I talk about Twisting Nether plus zero mana minion, it's pretty much just Abyssal Summoner is what he's looking at left as his way to actually put a big minion on the board on the same turn as his AoE. Yeah, otherwise he's going to have to just try and somehow get a weak spot when Fino doesn't play much and play Dragon right. Queen and the other two cards and hope he doesn't die on the backswing. It's not going to be easy, I'll tell you that. I mean, the other thing to consider, of course, is that if this hand is too expensive, which it's very much shaping up to be, Language Hacker could just plot to us. Just get this all back in and say, I hope that my expensive cards stay in the deck and I can draw them for zero. But he may just not have the time with the way this board is shaping up. And there's two or three portals left out of these four cards yeah, as well, yeah. I think. <laughs> I doubt Fino wants to put much down here. We might just see an Emerald, yeah, Emerald Explorer only and just pass. Oh! <laughs> What's even the best option there? I mean, I don't think you're ever picking vanilla Ysera. You're either picking new Ysera or Alex Straza, but both of them were really tempting. I think new Ysera is good because you've got so few cards left, you're just going to hit them all over two exactly. turns. And there yeah. should be a gap in the middle. Like, you should get like three, then four. Obviously, that's Language not how Hacker. maths actually works, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's just not hitting the cards here, is he? I mean, he sort of hasn't got them. He used a lot of cards early on trying to get the damage in. He yeah. burned the Mali. And he and is tapping thing... into all the garbage. You're right there. Yeah, he is. And we've got to consider as well that he probably doesn't want to plot twist until he hits Keladan as well. Because uh, being able to go like tap Keladan to clear the board and then develop something as well is a very powerful swing now that the Twisting Nether's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he could definitely still win this. Like, Fino is quite low. If Language Hacker gets one round of attacks in, he'll win the game. But I don't know if he ever will. I know. I mean, in terms of spells, it's just not there anymore. He's used both the uh, Nether Breaths. He's used both the Rain of Fires. Malagos gone, obviously. Soul Fires are really his last uh, chance in terms of burst damage. It's going to be trying to stick this Dragon Queen, I think. And I think this is why Fino is taking so long over this turn, which isn't particularly a Fino trait, because there's not many ways he can lose this, and picturing it's hard. Yeah, healing himself up. Like, this is the typical, I really don't see how I lose this, let's do everything to make sure it's, in case sure. I've missed something, it's as hard as possible for you.
That's one of the ways you can lose it. Yeah, I mean, he had to expect this at one point sooner or later. And Zephyrus to clear up two twos is a lot better than Zephyrus Nether uh, in order to clear up your massive Mount Cellar or Dragon board. I like the plot twist, actually. He's going to try and actually get yep. some zero mana cards that aren't garbage. I think it's very smart. <laughs> the only real good zero mana card he's looking to hit left is uh, Kelidan, or I believe... Dragon Queen Alex Straza would be all right. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, after he's shuffled, it obviously gets a lot better. But without yeah. shuffling, it was the summoner oh, of yeah. Keladan. At the time, it was rubbish, yeah. And now, if he can get one of the big dragons out oh. of his deck in order to go with Keladan, of which... Oh, Alex Strasov oh. was still in the deck, but he just drew it. So close. And that's all of the so three big close. things again, right at the end. He, he was in a great spot there. Okay, Zero Mana Zef gives him uh, Pyroblast opportunities down the line. It's just not development right now. He needed something to go on this board and start fighting back against Vino proactively. <laughs> I seem to have lost all my cards. <laughs> <laughs> Those quotes are awesome. Unless you're orange, of course. But we'll talk about that later and his tier list. Oh, joke I want to make, but I can't. But anyway, now Vino, uh, with the real last big board now, uh, looking to be, at least before the Ysera comes down, of course, from Language Hacker's perspective, he can be thinking, right, this is the final hurdle. If I can clear off this, I am looking to potentially just exhaust the Druid of all of its threats. Yeah, not knowing about the Ysera, of course, is a big deal. Um, but, yeah, we've been talking about the, the Warlock running out of threats, but you're right, he's, he's almost got this done. There is, of course, the Emerald Explorer that can get another Sierra that can make everything go horrible. <laughs> so just in terms of threat checks, Language Hacker here can quite happily say Zephyrus Nether, or I suppose uh, Zephyrus into uh, Shadowed Ruin. Uh, is a pretty good way to clear things up if you wanted to go for mm -hmm. the Abyssal Summoner. I would have to do that after, of course. Definitely an option. And it's there. Okay, okay. It, may, it just depends how he sees his route to victory. Does he think he can actually win with minions, or is he just now going to go full-on fatigue? I mean, this yeah, is insane, make it right? Yeah. No matter what win condition you, you're planning on going for here, this is just an incredibly powerful turn. Yep. Because now for Fino, even though he has the Ysera able to come down, this is slow. If he doesn't get rushing dragons or taunting dragons on the following turn, he may be dead before it even matters. And Hack has been low on ways to get tempo for so long, but he's found a way to get this done. Yeah, just that tiny little bit off lethal. I think it's going to be one mana off after all the card draws come down. Oh no, wait, sorry, he already took fatigue. Both of us racking our brains, I think, to try and find anything that makes this work. But I'm sure there is some combination, but I can't picture a realistic one. Yeah, exactly. The only kind of lifesteal dragon being Bronze Explorer could not attack right away. Uh, nothing that gives you health on a death rattle. I'm not seeing it either. And this actually fills up the board, so he can't even play the Emerald Explorer. That's true. Yeah. To try and get nice, lucky with something else. Just doesn't matter. Yeah. Just dead. Fino sends out the GG. And a hacker showing quite a lot of skill there for me. Yeah, very, very nicely done from our Canadian Grandmaster. I think a well deserved winner in a pretty stacked first match. You know, going up against Fino in the first round is not something that everybody wants to be up against, uh, I think I can say. But it was a very solid game from Language Hacker. From Fino on the other side, I do have a couple of questions about his uh, very. Uh, liberal use of his cheap spells. He was not holding them back for his Mount Cellar turns, and therefore his Mount Cellars were significantly weaker than they would usually be. Yeah, that is definitely something to look at, although it did look like he was in command in game number mm. four with the way he decided to use that coin early. So Very true. interesting to see how that progresses. Obviously, 1-0, oh, there's 350 players. 
joking aside, there's 175, 1 and 0. But there's a lot of GMs, a lot of ex-GMs, and a lot of good players near the top. So we're going to take a short break and get into round two for you pretty soon. Don't go anywhere or else.